everybody. My name's Elisa. Can you all hear me? Okay. My name's Elisa. I'm a 2015-2016 CHCI Health Graduate Fellow, um, originally from El Paso, Texas. I went to school in San Antonio where I received my MBA at Texas A&M. Um, I would like to thank everybody that's here for their time, especially uh, you Congresswoman Lujan Grisham. Just a few interesting things um, about Congresswoman Lujan Grisham. Uh, you can also go to her website, which is Lujan, uh, I'm sorry, it's lujangrisham.house.gov for more information on her bio. Uh, but I think the thing that stands out most about her is uh, like any great leader, she uses her personal experiences um, to drive her in office. So she is a caregiver herself. Uh, which really, she, she's able to dwell from that in all of her policy, um, particularly in an area where individuals are, are tired and may feel like they don't have a voice. I think that's one of the most impactful things is to have somebody like uh, Congresswoman Lujan Grisham um, in Congress advocating for those caregivers. Uh, she's a 12th generation New Mexican, um, but again, go ahead and visit her website for more information. I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn the mic to Congresswoman Lujan Grisham. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you, Lisa. All right, so uh, we did a hybrid where I started the workshop, had a lovely introduction. I'm very grateful for that. Uh, and uh, Elisa is exactly right. I'm in Congress really to work on health care reform and in the context of that to really focus as a priority on caregiving. Uh, in New Mexico, we've got more than 300,000 caregivers providing nearly 300 million hours of caregiving support. Uh, and uh, the national statistics are as overwhelming, and it really highlights that uh, uh, the number of Hispanic families, and particularly Hispanic women, who are shouldering the burden of caregiving in this country, uh, is both remarkable in what it's saving in Medicare and Medicaid costs, which are substantial, significant, uh, but in addition, if we don't invest in supporting those family caregivers, they will not be able to maintain that level of care, and we're actually creating long-term care issues for the caregivers, including long-term financial security. So the focus of this workshop is to really talk beyond Medicare and Medicaid, but we want to encourage your questions along those lines as well and uh, get some big top-line ideas about what this country can do that supports caregivers and to really highlight that that support in the context of Hispanic families. Uh, and I'm just going to give you a, a quick brief. Uh, as you heard from Alyssa, I, I am a caregiver. My mother is 76. She lives with me in Albuquerque. She has multiple chronic conditions. She meets the poverty level. Her only income is Social Security. Uh, it's insufficient for her to pay for any long-term care. It is sufficient to receive Medicaid uh, home and community-based supports, but she was on a waiting list for more than eight years. And during those eight years, I was the sole caregiver, which means dressing, bathing, eating, groceries, utility, money management, transportation, all of it. And in the context of having a full-time job and wanting to love my mother both, it is a very complicated effort. And I worry about what happens if I'm sick, and I worry about what happens in this job while I'm in DC. So this whole uh, workshop and this panel is to look at addressing ways to shore up caregivers. So to highlight it from another caregiver's perspective, we've got a short video, so I'm gonna draw your attention to the screen and ask my uh, fabulous assistant, Alma Acosta, to help us get that started. Can we get it louder? There we go. Well, it's been quite a changing dynamic from what it was initially four years ago to where we are today because he's had a second stroke. 103 over 62, but your pulse is kind of 
higher than it was today. That's probably good. I guess the saying is that cancer affects the whole family. Well, really, when you have someone who's been a stroke patient and you become a caregiver, it affects the whole family. But of course, I love my father so much. I would do anything I could to help him have the most comfortable life, however long it is, and to be in his own home. We had a three-generational home, so I had a grandmother that lived with us for 18 years, my, my mother's mother. And I remember my mother saying, we're not going to put her in a home, so I felt the same way about my father. No, I'm better see how I fall on my face. No, we don't want that, do we? There have been many times when he only needed one person to assist him, and he just got out of the hospital after being there almost two months, and it's taken two people oftentimes to help him, to give him the dignity to feel like he's part of the family, to not be isolated into, in, you know, into a bed because nobody's there to help get in and out of a bed. There are lots of good moments when he's either singing songs or you're watching a movie together. And of course, there have been some very hard moments. I guess the worst days is when you think he's, he's done or when you think, oh my gosh, he's lost his mind. But then the next day, everything's good again. Didn't you used to do something where you put no. in your middle initial? Once in a while. My father's always grateful for help. And it's been a transition to, you know, what is a caregiver? What does a caregiver do? It is a strain on baby boomers, um, the aging parents, and it's talked about both on uh, the financial and the uh, human toll that it takes on, on your life. You do it for love, though. You do the best you can, and it's because you love your family. So it's a short snapshot, but in that interview, which took 20 minutes, the interview has to be interrupted because she's at the home of her father, Julia, and he needs assistance to get out of the chair and into the wheelchair, uh, and then there will be further assistance, and her helper is only there one hour or so a day. Now, Julia retired early, which means her retirement income is reduced. And while I think all caregivers uh, do this out of love, um, she doesn't highlight as effectively because it's a hard thing to talk about the hardships of caregiving because there's guilt associated with feeling bad about caregiving. But the reality is 43% of caregivers report significant health issues of their very own and caregivers, particularly when it's a spouse taking care of another spouse or a spouse uh, or a parent taking care of an adult disabled child, they give out or we lose them before the person they're providing care to. And often their own hospital costs will outweigh the hospital costs in a year of the person they're, they're providing care for because they're emotionally and physically exhausted from providing that level of care. And in this situation, you've got a, uh, a parent who is communicative, semi-ambulatory, which means they can walk a little, and can engage. Many caregivers, particularly for older parents, are dealing with parents who are not able, not ambulatory, have significant behavior changes, have significant medication issues, uh, and are not able to communicate with their loved ones and may have dementia in the context that they don't even know who their caregivers are. And so it's a very complicated area, and we have only focused in trying to address it by looking at Medicare and Medicaid coverage, which means people are waiting and family caregivers aren't getting investments to support them to continue to do the job that they want to do. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Miriam. Miriam's going to introduce the panel. She's going to moderate, so I'm, I'm stealing her thunder. That's what happens when you have a member of Congress at a workshop. And then we're going to have big ideas about where we can shift the conversation to make a difference in the lives of millions of Hispanic families who are providing this level of care today. Gracias. Well, gracias, uh, Congressman um, Grisham, for your courage and actually your trust in sharing your personal story with us, uh, people in the room and people online. And again, this critically important topic as you're sharing, 
Um, they say caregiving may be one of the most important roles that someone will take in their lifetime. And it's typically not an easy role. And as the congressman pointed out, it tends to be more than 60% are women. And it, it tends to be uh, very difficult and it's something you don't prepare for sufficiently. So I'm glad we're having this panel so we can provide resources from our expert panel here. And it often comes with significant financial, as the congressman mentioned, physical and also emotional burdens. I think you alluded to also for, on the caregiver in terms of how they impact their health and also not only their physical health, but their emotional health as well. Uh, so again, muy orgullosa uh, to be moderating the panel. We have an expert group with us. Uh, I would encourage everyone in benefit of um, the time, I'm not gonna read everyone's complete bio. Hopefully everyone has downloaded the wonderful CHCI app. Everyone's bios and pictures are online uh, in the app there, so please do take time to read them. Uh, they have rich resources, reports they've worked on, uh, access to their organization website, so please do look at that. So today's panel will discuss the demographic trends and the challenges of caring for an aging population. The panel will also cover federal policies and legislation that provides support givers. You heard from the Congresswoman that we're gonna be doing a TED-like platform. By raise of hands, how many people have seen a TED Talk? Oh, wonderful, okay. So chévere, everyone knows exactly what we're referring to. So as the Congresswoman addressed, we're gonna be sharing big, you know, diverse, broad ideas and creative um, solutions in a very uh, short amount of time. So each panelist has five minutes. So thank you again for, for your brevity and focus. So let me start with our distinguished panel. We have, uh, first, uh, Rhonda Richards. Uh, she is currently a senior legislative representative uh, responsible for family caregiving, long-term services and support, and other issues at the federal level in government affairs at ARP. Uh, please look at her bio, she's worked on the Hill. Uh, she's worked as a, a majority staff director as, and a professional staff member in the subcommittee on aging of the U.S. Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pension Committee. Thank you, Rhonda, for joining us. Gracias, bienvenida. Uh, next, we have um, uh, Dr. Harry Parison. Uh, Dr. Harry Parison is the Executive Director of the D.H. Perifel Latin, Latino TV Incorporated, a media production nonprofit organization that produces multicultural bilingual television programs aiming at informing and educating Hispanic families on programs and services available. Next we have uh, Dr. Rick Green. Thank you, Dr. Green, for joining us. Uh, Dr. Uh, Green, um, excuse me, Rick Green is a master's in social worker. Uh, he started his career in aging at the New Jersey Department of Health and Senior Services. Uh, Rick also administers many federal and foundation grants. His work with family caregivers was partly the model for the National Family Caregiver Support Program. And, um, and last on our panel, we have Dr. Jim Wills. Uh, thank you also for joining us. Uh, across his career, he has held various positions in early stage business, primarily directing towards solving healthcare delivery solutions. Uh, he has served as a policy fellow of the state of New Mexico, assigned to support the Aging and Long-Term Services Department Secretary, followed by serving in a similar role for the state's medical assistance division. And right before we got started, he also talked about some of the technologies, how we can use some of these as tools in dealing uh, with some of these complex issues. With that, let me turn it over to Rhonda and bienvenidos to everyone. Thank you very much, Miriam. I'm happy to be here today with my fellow panelists and Congresswoman Lujan Grisham, who is really, truly an amazing champion for family caregivers in, in Congress. We're all fortunate to have her. Um, this is really an issue that affects everyone. Um, most of us are, have been, or will be a family caregiver or may need the help of one in the future to live independently. And family caregivers are really on the front lines of helping people of all ages live independently in their homes and communities where they want to be, whether it's an aging parent, a spouse, a sibling, aunt, uncle, child with a disability. It's really the family caregivers who are providing the most, the assistance, most of the assistance that they need, family, friends, and neighbors helping out. There are about 40 million family caregivers in this country that provide um, assistance to their loved ones. And if you put a dollar amount on the unpaid care they provide, it would be $470 billion mm -hmm. annually, which is larger than the entire Medicaid program in 2013. 
In addition, there are about 3.7 million family caregivers who care for a child under age 18 because of a medical, behavioral, or other condition. And there are about 6.5 million family caregivers who care for both an adult and a child. So this could be folks caring for aging parents and raising children, um, where you see multi-generational households um, and things like that. Some of the information I'm going to share today is from research from AARP and others, including the National Alliance for Caregiving and AARP on a study from earlier this year. So we talked, we, we saw some about what family caregivers do. It's everything from the help with eating, bathing, and dressing, to transportation and grocery shopping, help with medical and nursing tasks, like when someone comes home from the hospital, wound care, injections, things like that, managing finances, coordinating among different healthcare professionals, doctors, nurses, et cetera. And they provide that critical emotional support, too, for their loved ones. So family caregivers overall, about 60% are women and about 40% are men, and that number is growing. Family caregivers spend on average 18 hours a week helping their loved ones, and about 32% of family caregivers actually provide on average 62.2 hours a week helping their loved one, which is quite significant. Nearly a quarter of our caregivers in, in this country are millennials between the ages of 18 and 34, and about six in 10 family caregivers work either full-time or part-time. As was alluded to earlier, family caregivers face financial challenges. When you're looking at caregivers of older adults, family caregivers who are 50 and older report spending on average more than 10% of their annual, out of, annual income on caregiving expenses, which was an average of about $5,500, and that was in 07. The number's even higher for long distance caregivers. And when you look at lifetime impact on um, finances, estimates of, estimates of lifetime income related losses by family caregivers 50 and over who leave the workforce to care for an aging parent. On average, it's about $304,000 over the course of their lifetime in lost income and benefits. Family caregivers are also becoming more diverse. Um, nearly 20% of family caregivers are Hispanic, and there are about 7.6 million Hispanic family caregivers in this country. The typical Hispanic family caregiver is a 42.7-year-old female who's providing care to a 63.5-year-old female relative for a, a little over four years and an, on an average of about 31 hours a week. Um, Hispanic family caregivers and the people that they're caring for are youngest on average among different racial and ethnic groups, um, so folks um, are doing it sooner. Um, about three in 10 um, Hispanic family caregivers provide care at a full-time equivalent equivalency of 41 or more hours a week. Um, and Hispanic family caregivers are more likely to have worked while they're caring for their loved one, as you've heard from Representative Lujan Grisham herself. Um, you also heard about how care family caregivers face the physical, emotional, and financial challenges of caregiving. And so caregivers face this juggling act and uh, balancing their own needs and health and well-being and the needs of the loved ones that they are caring for. So support is really vital. Um, and so the ACT Caucus that um, Congresswoman Lujan Grisham co-chairs is part of that. And to put a big idea uh, out there on the table, this country should have a national strategy to help support family caregivers of loved ones of all ages um, that are taking on these tasks and really the unsung heroes um, and the silent army. Um, that's why we're a strong supporter of legislation called the Raise Family Caregivers Act. It's S1790. And HR 3099. Um, Representative Lujan Grisham is an original co sponsor of that bill in the House. Um, it was introduced by Senators Collins and Baldwin and Representatives Harper and Castor. And it would require the development of a national strategy to support better recognize and support family caregivers. And the strategy would include specific actions that government, communities, providers, employers, and others can take to better recognize and support family caregivers. And there would be an advisory council that, help, that would help the HHS secretary. Um, come up with the plan and that advisory council would include family caregivers themselves. Um, so thank you for the opportunity. Um, just as so you know, when you leave, you'll get some um, information, uh, some resources from AARP. We have a guide called Prepare to Care to help you have conversations with your family members um, and loved ones about um, coming up with a plan and, and how to care for them. And we also have resources in there from AARP and others, including our Caregiving Resource Center and things like that. And many of you may back may work back home with our state um, offices who work on these issues at the state and local level. So thank you and turn over to my fellow panelists. Great. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Dr. Carson, please. Thank you very much. Well, it's my pleasure also to be here with you today. I'm glad you're taking some time to um, be talking about caregiver issues. 
Uh, I want also to appreciate and say thank you to my fellow panelists that are here today. But I have a special um, uh, thing I want to tell you. I saw Congressman um, Michel <coughs> Lujan Christman last year at the NACOA, National Hispanic Council on Asian Capital Briefing. And then um, that was impressive to see which how much passion she talked about caregiver. You didn't see that, but I still have that picture in my mind when I saw her last year. So I'm going to ask you to give you a, a big one of applause for Congressman for what she does. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have Harry be on all my panels from now on. <laughs> yeah, but if you saw her the, the way I saw her last time in the briefing, you will have that impression. So she talked about caregiver with so much passion, and I know she does whatever she needs to do in the Congress to advance the, the issues in caregivers. Um, I'm, I'm talking today on behalf of the National Hispanic Council on Aging, on Dr. Janina Cruz and Maria Eugenia hernandez Len. Um, for some reason, they were not able to make it today, so they sent me and they say, well, I don't, I'm not going to be able to fit those big shoes, but I said, let me bring something to the table that would make the National Hispanic Council on Aging some, something for you to remember. Um, I'm going to talk about the perspective of age sensitivity, cultural and linguistic competence uh, when you deliver in caregiver. Now, picture that. You have your old folks, They've been, they came into this country 35 years ago. Um, they learn English. But you know, at the end of their life, for some reason, when people have been, when people are in the 70s, 80s, even if they've been in this country for 30, for 40, for 50 years, their native language came back. Their native language is coming back to them all the time. So they're more comfortable talking in their language. They speak English very well. You talk to them in English, they will understand very well, they will answer you in English. But, but if you put them together with somebody from their country, they're going to automatically speak in their native language. That's what happened also when they go to the doctor, when they go to see a lawyer, when they go to the bank, they're going to be more comfortable with somebody that speaks their, lang speak their language. That's why the doctor and also the caregiver they have to have that sensitivity to understand. And if they speak the language of that person, it's even better uh, uh, for them. They're going to feel more comfortable if somebody speaks Spanish. In Spanish, we, we talk if they're from Spain or Mexico, Honduras, Guatemala, whichever uh, Spanish country, they're going to feel more comfortable in Spanish. That's what we talk about, La Familia. The, the power of La Familia in, in the uh, Hispanic culture, um, you see your mom and your dad taking care of their mom and their dad. They're very reluctant to send them to a nursing home. So that's what we do. As a child yourself, you're going to learn, oh, I, I have to take care of mom and dad when she's old. Even if she's grumpy, you know, dad is 60 something or 70 years old, they become grumpy. Oh, I still have to take care of dad, that's what. He did that for my grandpa. He did that for my grandma, that's what I need to do. So we need to break that, that, uh, that concept that the caregiver have to be sensitive in the language, in the culture, they have to understand. For the Hispanic, if you serve a meal, if they don't have rice, maybe they're not going to be so happy that day. We know they have diabetes, they have other uh, problem, they need to eat less rice. But if you take the rice away from them, they're going to be sadness in their heart because that's what they ate in their hometown. They ate the rice and beans all the time. So this, this is some example of cultural sensitivity that the caregiver also need to be able to understand. So now, he said, why is that uh, Latino seniors are not signing up for critical services? There are services that are uh, very important, um, like the SNAP program. Even if the SNAP program, I know, uh, Congressman Lucian Chrisman has probably do some effort to increase the SNAP uh, allowance they give you every month. For example, somebody sign up for the SNAP program. So if you did, if you not, um, if you're not familiar with the SNAP program, it's supplemented nutrition assistant program. So, um, but they fill out a lot of paperwork. They give all their income. They somebody go interview them to the house. 
and at the end of the month, they qualify only for $20 a month. Well, it's not a lot, but it's something. But I know congressmen can try to work out to see, can we increase that a little bit? So the senior, we're talking about, we're talking about poverty here. We're talking about seniors that are making $13,000 a year, and they're paying $1,000 in rent, and they're living in substandard places, in very bad um, places. Some seniors, and then this is based on the study that NACOA, every year they do a study on the status of Hispanic older adults, the story from the fields. So we did that last year. And we find out that there, there are seniors that are eating cat food because it's less expensive than human food. That, that's hurt. You know, you see your grandma or your grandpa, they work all those years. They didn't plan to save for retirement because nobody showed them how to do that. So maybe we can show them they need to save for retirement. They need to save some money. They didn't do that. And now they don't work in, they don't have even $10,000 in the bank. Can you picture that? You, you work for 40 something years and at the end of all those years, how much you have in your bank account for you to live another 10 or 20 years. So this is what we want to continue educating and maybe the caregiver, they can do part of that also. They can be part of that, that, that uh, complex to help them. You know, well, have you, have you done something for your retirement now when you're young, not when you're 75 years old? So all those issues. And then the last one I want to talk about because they give me the one minute uh, warning already is why is immigration reform important for the growing America? Of course, immigration reform is something that we need to continue to um, push for because um, grandma and grandpa, they've been here, they're sitting there, they want to see the grandchildren, they want to see other family members that are far away, and then for some reason, they cannot, they, or either they cannot travel or the family member cannot come here. If we had immigration reform, all of those issues would be resolved because they can come here, they can even come for a shorter period of stay, they come, they do some work, they go back home, and then the family stay connected, they stay together. So uh, again, what do we need to do? Find more resources for the caregiver, educate them, also find more resources for the, for the um, seniors that they can, they can live above poverty level, not, not suffering when you when you in your old age and then not eating cat food. You know, this is very, very, um, 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 this is very sad. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Parson, um, for those bold ideas of really finding more resources. Uh, so Rick, uh, what are your bold ideas? What are you challenging us? Please. Thank you. Um, first, let me, uh, give you a little detail from one of the studies that we had done uh, on Hispanic caregivers. It was actually the first uh, research study on Hispanic caregivers and it was conducted in 2008. At that time, we found that one third of Hispanic households uh, report having at least one caregiver. And the estimates from that year were 8.1 million Hispanic caregivers, which is slightly less than what Rhonda mentioned uh, from caregiving in the US, but it, there was a different methodology used back in 2008. Now again, uh, Hispanic caregivers are predominantly female. They're 43 years of age on average and younger than non-Hispanic caregivers. The majority of people they're caring for are also female with an average of 62 years of age. Eight in 10 Hispanic caregivers take care of a relative, um, usually a mother, a sibling, or, the, or a father. And Hispanic caregivers spend more hours per week giving care than non-Hispanic caregivers. Um, 37 hours versus 31 hours a week. Over half of the uh, caregivers uh, help their care recipient with uh, getting in and out of beds and chairs or feeding. Um, many help uh, 
getting their loved one dressed and toileted and bathing and showering. 25% of them are dealing with incontinence issues. It's more common for Hispanic caregivers to live with the uh, person they're caring for than non-Hispanic caregivers. And three quarters of Hispanic caregivers live either with their care recipient or within 20, 20 minutes of that person's home. As far as health issues, uh, which entail the caregiving, diabetes is the top reason. Um, that a Hispanic caregivers say that their loved one needs care. It's followed by cancer, old age, and arthritis. Um, Alzheimer's is cited by only 6%. However, the uh, research study asked for the primary issue. But when you look at the secondary issue, then 23% of the Hispanic caregivers indicate that their loved one is facing a some sort of cognitive impairment. Four in 10 caregivers indicate that as a result of their caregiving, they've had to make a major change in their work situation, such as cutting back on working hours, changing jobs, stopping work entirely, or taking a leave of absence. And as far as their household, uh, two-thirds of the caregivers were married, and half have children under the age of 18 living within the household. One of the other, um, the National Alliance for Caregiving also serves as the uh, secretariat for the International Alliance of Care Organizations. Everyone else calls them caregivers, carers, but in the U.S. Um, we currently have uh, 11 nations that are members and two more are expected to join within the next two months. One of our priorities for the next year will be to convene a meeting in Latin America and to work with researchers there as well as government officials to begin to create an infrastructure of support services for family caregivers in those nations. At this point in time, um, there are sporadic services um, here, there, but not nationwide, and many of the services are disease specific, primarily Alzheimer's or maybe multiple sclerosis. I just want to throw out a few issues that maybe we'll have an opportunity to discuss in the uh, balance of the uh, panel. Um, we're also coming out with a new report in January that's focusing on caregivers of persons with severe mental illness. And that also will be one of the first studies on that topic. And I think it's quite timely now in, in, with regard to Oregon and Charleston. <coughs> One of the issues I, I would like us to, to maybe consider either today or in the future is HIPAA. Mm -hmm. HIPAA is creating major problems for family caregivers. I know because my brother and I were caregivers for my, uh, my parents and the physicians refused to talk to us and share information on their care. It's, it hasn't changed much over the years. I also think that it's imperative that, the, uh, that there's a concerted effort to reauthorize the Older Americans Act. The Older Americans Act has the bulk of family caregiver funds within it, the National Family Caregiver Support Program, the Lifespan Respite Program, et cetera. Um, it's been flat funded since I was the first director back in 2000. It, the funding is essentially maybe $10 million more than it was back then. I think we need to look at telehealth and see how that can benefit family caregivers. And I think you're going hopefully, I uh, think you're going to be speaking to that, right? I hopefully. will now. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry. Um, lastly, I think we need to focus on rural caregivers. That's. Um, 
a there are tremendous uh, handicaps for these caregivers. The, uh, there's a paucity of healthcare providers in many rural states, and in order for the caregiver to get medical assistance for their loved one, they may have to uh, travel hundreds of miles, and this is where telehealth ties into that. And uh, one last thing is, um, I think we have to look at children, children as caregivers. We did a study 10 years ago and found uh, that there were approximately 1.2 million children between the ages of eight and 18 that are providing significant care to usually uh, a disabled mother or grandmother. And uh, these children um, need support services, they need interventions, they need, these aren't dysfunctional families, they're functional families, and it's in our best interest to maintain these families. <coughs> I'll stop here, thanks. Thank you, Rick, for, um, for those great ideas. Um, and then uh, Dr. Wills, um, innovation, what innovations can you share, perhaps telehealth, telemedicine, telepsychiatry? What can you share with us? So I think the other speakers have good, done a good job of teeing up my comments. But just before I begin, I'm from Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I kind of giggle when I hear Congresswoman because we all know her as Michelle. <laughs> so you'll have to apologize, but I'm going to refer to her as Michelle. And so just by way of background so you understand where I'm coming from, we actually, uh, I met the Congresswoman in probably 15 years ago, and I'm not sure what I had to do faster, learn, or walk to catch up with her. So she has the gait of a six foot tall woman, and we're happy as being a resident of Bernalillo County that you carry that stature for us here on the Hill as well. So thank you. And just by way of background as well, so in a previous life, I ran a company that focused on reducing preventable readmissions, meaning when your mom has heart failure, she gets discharged, she comes home, she gains weight, she goes back to the hospital. So we tried to figure out a way to prevent that from happening. And then also, I'm a medical doctor by trade, and so I have an appreciation of what data I would like to see to be able to take care of your mom and dad's critical, critical chronic conditions and keep them in their home. And so usually I use PowerPoint slides, but today I'm gonna to be creative. And so I want all of you to think about long-term care as a continuum, meaning your mom is at home. That's where you want her to stay. Now she can progress, she can progress across that continuum to the acute care setting and everything in between, right? informal caregiving, as we've talked about, formal private pay caregiving, home health care, off to an assisted living facility, to nursing home, then to the hospital. And so think about that continuum as I make my remarks, because what we want to do is front load the incentive and technology process to keep your mom and dad at the front end of that continuum. And so in thinking about that, today what we have both policy-wise and in the marketplace, we have accountable care organizations. Are you familiar with those? Mm -hmm. Okay, so in my opinion, those reach from the acute care setting to as far towards the home as home health care, right? Because many delivery systems have home health care organizations that they own and then can appropriately be able to share data and essentially go ahead and spread incentives across all caregivers to be able to manage your mom's care very well. What you also have is you have programs to prevent hospital readmissions for heart failure, for pneumonia, for COPD, for all the usual suspects that all of our loved ones tend, tend to have to deal with as they grow older. And so my big idea today is that today's policy environment and healthcare delivery environment misses the front end of that process. And so we're all informal caregivers here, right? In some form or fashion. And we may supplement our efforts with, with home care assistance, right? Your, 
who you see the commercials for. Have somebody come on in and take care of mom, take care of dad. Now that's where the story begins. The management of chronic disease begins with the story that your parents tell you. It begins with their activities of daily living. It continues with their instrumental activities of daily living. And it is carried forward by the stories that you as caregivers see on a daily basis and by those stories that are captured by folks you have in the home. So how do we go ahead and capture that data? And so as policy folks here in the room, we have a number of policy fellows, I think, I'd like you to think about using technology to reach forward to the home to capture those stories and that data. The, the nickel word is observational data. So you want to marry clinical data, meaning the glucometer at home, that is taking mom's blood sugar reading, you want to marry that with observational data. <coughs> how much is she voiding, right? She may go to the bathroom 10 times a day, but how much is she voiding? Is she retaining urine? Is there a concern about a UTI that isn't caught? She becomes septic and then she's vented <coughs> in the ICU for a week. That's a terrible outcome. And so we've talked about the, the challenges that caregivers face. So the policy guy in me thinks, how do we go ahead and provide the caregiver with help or respite? And so I think an illustrative technology that is available today, and the AARP does a great <coughs> job of, go to their technology page on their website, they do a nice job of talking about some of these specific vendors in these spaces. But I wanna talk to you about sensor technology, meaning sensors in the home, right? Sensors on the commode, sensors on the refrigerator, sensors on the front door, sensors on the O2 tank, right? Amazing data that can be captured by sensors so that myself, I can come to DC, my granddad's in Chicago, I can log in and see how much has he moved that day, right? Has he gone to the commode? But more importantly, where the system has to go is not just me as grandson, it has to be able to get to the primary care doc, right? In a way that is single login. So I can go ahead and see it and perhaps a member of my care team, our nurse, can go ahead in the morning and see that, you know what, that Charlie Wills hasn't voided in a day. We need to have some sort of intervention. And then maybe that's where telephony comes into play. And so right now what you have is a system that is incentivized and staffed, which is progress according to the ACO paradigm, right? Which again, think about acute care, L tax reaching forward to home health care. Those folks are more or less integrated or are getting there, right, with a unified EHR. So as policy folks, what I want you to think about, and I'm just trying to watch my time here, what I want you to think about is as new technologies become available, I really get excited about sensor data. Mm -hmm. But with any technology, what you need to think about is, does it provide actionable data, right? I mean, does it give you data that you can act on? Does it work? Not just does it work, meaning is it effective on its own, but is it effective within the context of how you manage that disease, right? And so does it actually help outcomes? And then you want to be able to think about how do we properly align incentives, right? How do we go ahead and do we reimburse for that, right? Or is it just something that the care team will purchase on their own because they're capitated, so they're at risk for that care, right? And then also, of course, you have to be aware of fraud, right? How easily can this, can this device or technology be manipulated? And then, I mean, core to this issue today are cultural sensitivities, right? I mean, how do, using sensors as an example, how does that make sense for different cultures? Is it intrusive? Do you have to do something with it? Right? And so, just before I close, today, home care technology is a $6 billion industry. And it's old school, right? It's walkers, it's glucometers, it's those types of things. It's going to skyrocket to a $20 billion industry by 2012. And you'll have a lot of these tip of the sphere technologies that'll become available that you as policymakers will have to vet and think about. So, I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Willis. And, and really, uh, using technology, but what you said at the end, too, of really thinking culturally appropriateness for, for this very unique uh, audience we have of our Latino community. Um, gracias to everyone for your uh, creative, bold ideas and challenge to the audience.
I have a few questions that I've uh, drafted, but let me open it up to the audience first. Uh, we have a mic right there on the floor. Please uh, state your name and your organization and the question to the entire panel or to a particular individual. Gracias. Oh, wonderful. We've got lots of questions. You st look at this panel. You stirred up lots of uh, respondents. Go ahead, please. Hi, my name is Randy Prabula. I am a volunteer mentor for students from Gaithersburg High School in Gaithersburg, Maryland, in Montgomery County Public Schools. We're here as part of this program. Uh, I have really three interrelated, very minor questions and, and big picture questions I want to pose. Um, one of them relates to given the nature of chronic conditions and how we're looking at health care, and despite the fact that the Affordable Care Act offers coverage for issues, what can we do to incentivize the coverage, the mandatory coverage and access to subsidies for home care assistance and mental health care for caregivers, individuals in that position where they have to provide that care? Related to that, what are we doing to front load not just the identification and the treatment of these chronic conditions, but treating them when they're acute conditions to keep them from becoming chronic conditions. Identifying them is great, but what are we doing to incentivize their treatment? And then from the Latino perspective, from the Hispanic community perspective, what are we doing to encourage the breaking down of the barriers of the failure to communicate from the individual patients to their primary caregivers? They're afraid to tell the doctor really and engage in a dialogue. What are we doing to break down the barriers to that dialogue? Anyone can start? Uh, for, for, I, th I guess for the last uh, comment that you made, um, Stanford University has a um, six weeks self-management workshop that um, empower patients to um, be able to um, not only take care of themselves, but also they can bring the caregiver um, and the caregiver can learn how to empower him or herself and also empower the patient to communicate with the provider. Because that's what, what if you go to the doctor, this is one of the things that um, we facilitate or we teach at the workshop. If you go to the, to the doctor and you don't take off your shoes so the doctor can see your feet, he's not going to see your feet or her. But if you take your shoes off and then leave your feet like that, he's going to say, oh, I need to check that feet. So those are these kind of things that, that is being taught at, uh, at the Stanford Community Workshop. Now, for the, other, for the other one, for the resources, I guess we got to talk with Congressman Michelle again to see. I know she's working on probably something. We, we need to get more money for, for services for the seniors. How are we going to get there? Congress have the, uh, whatever, it's your turn. Ow, uh, <laughs> left side, the hardest part. Uh, you've asked actually a very, uh, not only interesting, but a complex set of things in this country that I think go well beyond, but I want to touch on them, uh, long-term care issues and minority health issues or minority health disparities. I just did a talk about that right before I got here. But the reality is that in spite of the Affordable Care Act, pre and post, we don't have enough providers to, to garner just basic access in this country. So we have, a, we, we have a, a, a culture here where you only work with your healthcare provider when you're acutely ill, right? We don't have a culture of preventative and investments so that you're creating an environment where we're a healthy population, uh, not the reverse. As a result, we, we pay for the chronic treatment of diseases, not for the prevention uh, and cure of those diseases. Uh, the reality is, is that we wouldn't have to have really a long-term care workshop of any kind if the focus in this country was to prevent diabetes in its entirety and to cure Alzheimer's. Now, I don't want to have any disrespect to Parkinson's and ALS and multiple sclerosis and, and any number of significant debilitating diseases that require caregiving and are also devastating to the patient and the family. But the reality is we still have a healthcare culture in this country that doesn't aim at preventing and doing the research necessary to solve those. If we didn't have Alzheimer's as an issue, the pressures that are coming for caregivers would be hugely mitigated and uh, we could go on to then making sure that we've cured and prevented every type of cancer. So you really asked maybe the end of this uh, uh, or, or uh, uh, highlighted 
If we create a fully integrated healthcare model in this country that's really about public health and primary care, and we begin to focus on prevention and cures instead of long-term treatments, there is no doubt in my mind that Harry isn't going to have to ask me about what I'm doing to shore up the country's budget so that my priorities can be funded, which are your priorities to invest in these health care issues, because they won't be a problem. We have to completely shift how this country feels about the way in which we garner our health care. And that has to start uh, uh, with, uh, and we heard that a little bit, with children. Because we're not going to change that dynamic for the 40 and 50 and 60 and 70 year olds. We can mitigate. But we're going to have to start with early education. And we don't do a health care education in this country. So that's a, a, a long answer, if that was an answer. And I think that requires a whole different set of workshops. But I applaud you for recognizing that we ought to front load these efforts instead of doing it on the back end. But we're at the back end, ladies and gentlemen. So I want to make sure that we address all the problems for caregivers and their families as we do that. But thank you. Uh, Rhonda had a response. I'm just, gonna, yeah. um, build, just building on thank the good you. responses. I think another challenge when um, we heard about the Thanks. fact the, how caregiving can impact family caregivers' health is that oftentimes family caregivers don't identify themselves as family caregivers, and healthcare professionals like doctors and nurses may not be aware that they are caregivers. But if that can be identified more up front, that if doctors know they are caregivers, they know that they might be more vulnerable um, you know, to their own health deteriorating, to stress, mental health issues, and things like that, that can help encourage some of those earlier preventive kinds of conversation and awareness. And, and just so that you can see, we're having a dialogue. You probably should have done this at the front end, but I promise I'll stay as long as we've got questions questions unless I've got a vote. But the other issue is that while we've got lots of legal tools and lots of resources, we really do, wh whether we're using them productively yeah. is something else altogether. Whereas a caregiver for my mom, I both have uh, generic state authority as a family member when she can't decide for herself or is having trouble deciding for herself. I'm given legal authority by state law to act on her behalf. And I have a specific authority because we've executed a health care power of attorney. Mm -hmm. now, now set those aside for a minute. My mom doesn't <coughs> want me to always know all the stuff that's going on. And quite frankly, as her daughter, caregiver, and lawyer, mm -hmm. I don't think she should have to disclose. So when she's being treated for depression, the last person she wants in the room is me. Yep. I might be the source of that. <laughs> uh, and I mean that without being disrespectful, right. right? She's depressed by the notion and feels guilty that I have to be her primary caregiver. And that's a conversation that she needs to have privacy. So we have a very interesting, complicated set of issues here. One, I need to be identified as the caregiver, and I go nuts when her primary care or anybody else uh, excludes me from a care plan. Because without me, it can't get executed. I am equally offended and angry when any provider, anyone touches my mother's life in any way, disrespects her by not asking her and treating her as the patient. She gets to decide. These are conflicting environments. And they take, uh, that's a whole other uh, ethical, and uh, that's, uh, I guess that's workshop number two. But this is a very complicated area. And it's very challenging and frustrating, which is why it's hard to be the person receiving care. And it's really hard and challenging to be the person providing care. And just one last comment yeah. on that, 30 seconds, and that we, the, the, the system needs caregivers data. That is the canary in the mine mm -hmm. shaft, right? You know your loved one so well that we have to be able to capture that data on the front end and make it actionable in some way in which we can intervene and keep folks in their house. And so again, as you go forth <clears throat> in your policy careers, just think about that. It doesn't, the system doesn't start with the hospital, it doesn't start with home health care. Right? Those are solutions to a problem that you potentially could have avoided earlier on in a properly aligned system. So, ah, And then for the mental sanity, caregivers also, especially when it's a caregiver that is a family member, they need a break because this is a very stressful situation that you live in. Sure. They need a break uh, very often in a, in able to be able to continue giving that care. 
Go ahead. Next question. Okay. Uh, my name's Elisa. I'm from El Paso, Texas. I'm a CHCI Health Graduate Fellow. Uh, so I have a comment and a question. Um, I want to thank CHCI for hosting this panel. Mm -hmm. Um, and AARP. And yes, AARP, uh, because I think this, uh, being a caregiver specifically for my generation is a mm. very abstract, mm. um, it's very abstract. Uh, until it hits you, you really have no concept of what being a caregiver <coughs> is. Uh, but you all had mentioned that um, the average age caregiver is in their mid 40s. Um, so I wanna kind of challenge my peers to also think that while we're focusing on the context of advanced age. Um, we have caregivers giving to young children. Um, in my area of El Paso, Texas, we have a large military base. Um, so we also have spouses that are becoming <laughs> caregivers to veterans. Um, and then by some reports, uh, the suicide rate amongst caregivers for those individuals, for veterans, is actually multiples higher than that of veterans. So caregiving is very important. So that's my mm -hmm. comment. Um, the second thing is I appreciate that we're discussing access to caregivers and, uh, and that is important, but um, Congresswoman Lujan Grisham, when you were Secretary of New Mexico's Aging and Long-Term Services, you went undercover to, uh, on regarding patient abuse issues. Mm -hmm. So what I kind of also want to say that is important, not only access to caregivers, but quality mm -hmm. of the caregivers that I don't know that we've addressed and that is still very important. Um, all of you had mentioned you know, the <coughs> dire constraints that uh, caregivers are living in, poverty. Um, I know that respite care is always available, but that doesn't necessarily- Not always available, or, not okay. even readily available, not available nearly enough. It's the opposite of that. So, uh, so what are we doing also as advocating for vulnerable uh, individuals to ensure that they're receiving quality long-term, um, quality caregiving services? So uh, this is good because I'm gonna advocate now to uh, CHCI that we should just do a conference on healthcare. Um, and, and the reality is it's so complicated uh, and has so many aspects that I really think it needs the attention of, of at least a week. And I really appreciate your passion and attention. I, I'm gonna not answer all of those uh, statements or questions, because uh, I don't think we have time, but I do wanna highlight that there is a generational aspect here that I'm trying to address in legislation. And, and part of it is, if all 49 million caregivers reached out at once and there are how that hasn't happened, I, I don't really understand. Because they don't get enough support to continue to do what they're doing. It would collapse the entire long-term care and healthcare system in this country overnight. The notion that Congress or any government or private funding source could spend enough money in the current context of who needs care in this country is also impossible. We would be talking about numbers that look a lot like the national debt. They're not real numbers. They're so big nobody can write it on a piece of paper. That means that we have to invest in a whole different way, right? It can't be Medicare and it can't be Medicaid. Now we gotta do lots of changes there and lots of changes in the Affordable Care Act, lots of educational changes, and we gotta recognize that we have to have an investment in the caregivers themselves, which is part of the context of this workshop. So I have a bill called Care Corps. Because we're also creating a divide to your point about do we really understand caregiving and what does it means something different to so many uh, different individuals and it is age based in large part. So how about a program that creates a national service program in this country? And how about if we recruit younger people to do non-skilled direct care, more companion level care, driving, assistance with eating, uh, helping with that observatory data, engaging in that family environment. And then we're gonna give you a stipend in housing and for a one year to two year <laughs> service, then we're gonna pay for college or pay back college debt. So that we're creating both an added, we're providing um, uh, an experience so that we're, we're lessening the generational divide between uh, millennials and younger folks who don't believe that social security uh, will exist or should exist, mm -hmm. who don't understand the graying uh, of America, or in fact the entire world for that matter, 
And if we can create a better partnership that's really about valuing individuals and investing in independence, I do think that we can start to invest our resources in a more meaningful way and have a, a, a totally different dynamic in this country. So uh, it's, it's uh, legislation that I'm very excited about and I think is beginning to get some, so keep your fingers crossed if you like this idea and if you don't, I, I apologize to you. But I think it's getting some national attention about another way of shoring up a familial caregiving environment which quite frankly we need to survive the long-term care issues in this country which means we need Hispanic families to continue to do what they're doing. We just need to do it in a way that provides them more benefits and resources. All right. And it's called Care Corp? It's called Care Corp. Got it, got it. Next question, please. Hello, my name is Margarita Chavez. I'm from Bernalillo County Public Safety, and I was a graduate uh, CHCI Health Fellow last year. Um, so I'd first like to mention, you know, thank you so much for referencing the fact that Latino families are very unique in this in this specific issue. Um, you know, it's, I, I am a testament to seeing my parents who are currently taking care of their of their parents, and shows me that I will never put my parents in a home because that was what I learned and that's where I, where I grew and it's it's a root of my culture. Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel that that is very unique to the Hispanic and Latino population, as you know, very true and near and dear to New Mexican families. Mm -hmm. Um, aside from that, the question that I'm going to, to raise is looking at behavioral health and looking at mental health resources and or lack of resources mm -hmm. for this population, caregivers as, as well as our aging population. Um, you know, Congresswoman, as you know, we're doing a significant, um, significant work around behavioral health back in, in New Mexico and behavior in uh, Bernalillo County specifically, but I feel that the population, the, the, the aging population is often left out of that discussion. <coughs> Um, we, we are looking at um, the population that is um, being seen in the media, being uh, arrested, being taken into the emergency rooms on a regular basis, but we are not looking at uh, people who have that continuum of Alzheimer's, dementia, and, and many of these things that we don't see as the quote unquote typical behavioral health issues that we see that are uh, in, in terms of crisis. Um, so what resources and or suggestions do you have to raising awareness around providing mental health services, not only to caregivers, but also to the patients that we are caring for? And how can we, how can we readily make that available to our, Latinos, our Latino families who don't often access services in the first place? Or, or who also, uh, in terms of cultural competence, are wary of those investments right. in their own health. Right. Right. Uh, so, uh, uh, preaching to the choir, we've got, uh, we don't have enough geriatricians. We don't have real mental health pop, uh, uh, parity, even though that's a requirement now in insurance coverage, but it's how they provide that coverage, and I would argue that they, they don't do a very effective job. Older persons have really been left out of the equation significantly for effective behavioral health services. Uh, that's been a problem, uh, a significant problem that hasn't gotten uh, the attention, largely uh, because uh, that work is not, and I, I, I'm sure I'm going to offend someone, but the, the specialty care engaged in geriatric health, it's no reimbursement. Mm -hmm. there, there's not a vehicle to create a health care response to, to that uh, uh, dynamic, and we really need it. And, and I'm just gonna do just two quick things and then congratulate you and tell you that UNM actually does some great work. Mm -hmm. Most geriatric mental health issues end up in inpatient environments. We don't, we, we end up, I think, over-medicating a geriatric population for not just chronic depression, but we end up with individuals in this dynamic that we don't know, we have no idea really in the, in the medical world, in my opinion, I play a doctor on TV, uh, how to address this. So here's the dynamic. As we're aging longer, you are in fact supporting, as family caregivers or not, a 80-year-old patient who is bipolar, mm -hmm. has depression, and has Alzheimer's and figuring out the complexities of that design mm -hmm. in terms of providing adequate psych psychiatric and counseling interventions and the right medication management, I would say, needs a whole lot more research. And when you look at state facilities and long-term care facilities, for me, the two, the two segments are 
the behavioral health issues that uh, cause uh, family members to make placements that they would otherwise uh, not do, which is about $100,000 a year, 80 to $100,000 a year taxpayer funded often. And, it, and before it's taxpayer funded, your $10,000 is out the window in two months because uh, all of your assets are gone before you're eligible for that Medicaid level of service. Or it's incontinence. I mean, those are the two things that drive these populations into long-term care facilities. And so it's an area that we need a whole lot more of specific attention. And I think the way that we do that is we're going to have to continue to make that part of the primary care model under the Affordable Care Act. And without that, we're not going to get the, the attention. And then I know I'm taking too long. We've only got like eight minutes left. But yeah, it's my workshop. So <laughs> Well, I think Dr. Um, you like Wills that? and well, Rick wait a minute. I'm, I'm not done. I'm sorry, Dr. Wills. <laughs> See can't, be, see can't be a moderator with a member of Congress. <laughs> it's impossible. She's doing, you're doing a great job, Miriam. But I, I congratulate Bernalillo County for the members here who are not from Albuquerque and Bernalillo County. They're going to invest about $100 million into behavioral health because right. New Mexico, in my opinion, has the worst behavioral health system now in the country. Uh, we won't go into that here, but we do. And I challenge you not to create another administrative structure and not another managed care environment, but to look at the insufficient direct care aspects and to garner those providers into our communities and to focus on the issues that you just identified as being problematic. Wonderful recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. So Rick and Dr. Wills, yeah, please. Rick, can you go first? I just wanted to mention that uh, there's a group of uh, organizations in, in Washington, um, NCOA, AARP, the National Alliance for Caregiving, Easter Seals, We've been um, discussing with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services about uh, the need for a caregiver assessment mm -hmm. uh, for both the uh, Medicare as well as the Medicaid enrollees. Now, um, this would be a baseline assessment. However, um, we all know from research that the caregiving trajectory starts with maybe just helping someone with transportation and maybe meal pr uh, preparation. But over time, due to the progression of the chronic conditions, much more intensive care is provided. So the assessment would have to periodically be repeated. Mm -hmm. And hopefully uh, we'll see some promise in the near future on this. So I'll be very quick, but I heard two things from your question, <coughs> rural health and mental health. And so mental health is difficult to treat based upon the current data we get, meaning talking to a patient, <coughs> asking them to, to, to describe their mood. There's no blood test for mood, right? But here's where that observational data, if we can capture it, becomes so meaningful, right? Your activities of daily living the things you do at home. Those are the things that are actually the diagnostic criteria for many mental illnesses. And so if we can have that data captured in some way, it helps us understand better if someone's depression is worsening or improving. And so, again, level of activity. Are you eating? Are you, are you sleeping well? Or is your sleep worsening, right? Are you getting out of the house? Those are the things that if we can see that data trended in some way when we're seeing that patient either via the office or if it's rural through telephony, right? That will help us be able to better treat that patient. And so again, think about the front end, think about that data. Just Thank real you. quick, on the prevention side, caregivers can also feel isolated and alone, that they're the only one that's going through everything that they're going through. So connecting them with other caregivers, connecting them with community resources and other people can also be helpful to preventing that isolation, which could impact depression and other kinds of things as well. So that's another important aspect. Thank um, you, Rhonda. Just, Thank just you. quickly, for the Hispanic family, we still have a lot of education to do because mm -hmm. you have to teach them it's okay to go for mental health care because right. it's not well accepted, as you know, in the Hispanic family. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that very important Thank comment. Um, so I see we have three people uh, lined up for questions. So can I suggest maybe each of you say your name and your organization and ask your question, each of you, and then we'll have the panel address all three questions. Por favor. Um, hi, good afternoon. Thank you for being here. My name is Jesse Amon. I'm a CHCI uh, 
congressional intern. I'm from New York City. So this is actually something very dear to me. My mom was diagnosed with lupus um, a few, uh, when I was younger at the same time that my dad lost his job during the economic recession. And so it was a really hard time. So although I wasn't the primary caregiver, my dad was, was and at the same time looking for a job. And we applied for, well, my mom applied for disability for her and a whole nother like snap and all of that. And they denied it to her. So this is something that's dear to me. Like I, I want to know what Congress is doing. I know there's a lot that needs to be done with health healthcare reform, but what exactly like criteria can be focused on, on, on fixing that? Because there's a lot of people that I know that, that need the help and, and they don't receive it. Thank you. Gracias por la pregunta. Next person. Hi. I'm a little shorter than her. My name is Tatiana Nin, and I'm an MPA student at George Washington University, but I am also a program manager for the National League for Nursing. Yeah. And part of my job is to create and develop grants on integrating geriatric education and nursing wow. programs okay. because a lot of the problem is not just the older adult and the implications. It takes a team. It's a social worker, it's the nurse, it's a direct career worker, et cetera. But it is very important to, as you mentioned before, to really prepare the, the physicians and the nurses in geriatric care because they are not prepared as of now. It's not part of the curriculum, et cetera. But um, somebody mentioned the older, um, older American Act, Medicare, Medicaid, and there are so many factors to address this problem and, how, and the implications for the caregivers. So I wonder, what are your suggestions to break down the silos on tackling every problem that, that is the, the caregiver is facing and the older adult is facing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can you help our third one get to the mic? <laughs> so this is my daughter coming to the mic. I'm a bit alarmed. <laughs> Let's see what she can do. Uh, well, uh, the audience heard the challenge of getting the, the young, younger generation. <laughs> Thank you for that practice. Can I sit with my dad now? <laughs> You want to join up here? You're we'll have welcome. to leave that to the congresswoman. Oh. All right, we're close. We're five minutes out, Olivia, so that's great. So we have a closer. Every uh, conference um, and every workshop ought to have an uh, uh, in-audience closer. Um, I I'll do a couple of things. The system's incredibly complicated and fragmented. Congress uh, isn't doing enough, and neither are states. Now, the reason it's so siloed is because you have all these independent finance structures, and everything is means-tested. And I would argue that even Medicare in that context is absolutely means-tested, so that we're rationing different components of care. For me, uh, the daily struggles of providing care to my mom are, are not that challenging anymore. And actually, I'm getting help now, right, because she's, I said she's now eligible for a program. It's navigating all the other resources that she needs in order to remain independent, which can take 20 to 40 hours a week where I'm making phone calls chasing physicians and nurse practitioners and pharmacists and dentists and counselors and homemakers and home health workers and the person who's delivering the groceries. It's nuts. And it's because they're all different mm -hmm. systems of care and they don't talk to each other. So here in terms of those big ideas, if, if there's a, we, we have yet in this country to create a long-term care strategy, which would mean you'd create a universal, and I don't want to say application, application not in terms of eligibility, but an application, an adjustment of how we deliver those resources as a pool. We need to pool those resources and leverage them, and all those systems of care have to be fully integrated, and it needs to be a team approach for chronic care conditions. It cannot be uh, one, a physician, a caregiver, a nurse, a psychiatrist, it cannot be, it won't work. And uh, states like New Mexico have long worked on integrated care, but like the Older Americans Act, there, there are small piloted grants that really don't move the needle. So your job here is to help us make this a priority. That's what moves the needle. And Congress is gonna have to come to grips with the investments we make today will save billions of healthcare dollars in the future. And so that's my job, is to educate other members of Congress about what their opportunities are here. 
Thank you for asking this. Go ahead. Um, it, to the point about folks working together and avoiding silos, um, actually AARP and the National Hispanic Council on Aging and National Alliance for Caregiving are actually part of a coalition called the Elder Care Workforce Alliance mm -hmm. that is actually focused on trying to have um, a health care and, and long-term care workforce that meets the needs specifically of older adults as they age and making sure that there's an interdisciplinary team approach where you have the different disciplines coming together, whether it's a doctor, a nurse, social worker, nutritionist, um, psychiatrist, whatever the case may be, that you've got the right team with the right experience that's coming together and talking and trying to meet the needs of the individual and the family caregiver, that that's the way it needs um, to, to work. Um, just also to the coordination and silo issue, um, the bill that I talked about earlier, the RAISE Act on National Strategy to Support Family Caregivers actually brings together different federal agencies, different stakeholders to come together and, and talk about what are some of the best ways to, to coordinate, um, the, meet the needs of family caregivers and things like that. So that's another way to potentially help address, but the issues are very complex. And then just, I mean, your questions are, both those questions are such rich questions, we could spend weeks discussing those questions. But just to focus on a couple important items here, the care team, again, we're closing soon here, to reiterate, includes the patient and the caregiver. Yes. So you have to get their data, right? And so what you're seeing right now, I won't name names, but there's some interesting research that's being done through Harvard specifically with a very large national home care uh, agency and some technology vendors to actually measure the impact of capturing that data, meaning ADLs, lifestyle data, voiding, how much urine output, those types of <coughs> things, to actually measure how does it work and is it a good investment and can we prevent a lot of things that you'd be stunned how many simple conditions, exacerbations of simple con conditions drive patients to the ICU. It's sad because you look back at the record, at the chart, and you can see how it could have been prevented. And so if you leave this room, one thing for me, just think about including the caregiver and the patient in the data that drives the care. Uh, when you leave this room today, support the caregivers, if, you, if he's your neighbors, your friend, your family member, and on behalf of the National Hispanic Council on Aging, I want to say thank you to all of you for participating today. Thank yeah. you, Congressman. Please help me thank our panels and the Congressman sure. for her leadership and courage. Gracias. Mil gracias. And I will, uh, we're going to close now. We are over time, but really glad to see the interest, the commitment from our panel and from the audience. Uh, for those who, who were online, please go to the Congresswoman's website. There's an email on there. If you had questions that we weren't able to address, please send them directly to her. You heard amazing, bold ideas about the national strategy. Care Corps, you know, the ethics, the teamwork, the workforce development, all these incredibly insightful ideas. Please see how you can participate and email the Congresswoman how you can get involved. Y gracias a todos. Ciao. Thank you.